you want to open to John 19, you're going to start in the Gospel of John in chapter 19. I'm going to look with you at what John said there, that the things he recorded that happened during the crucifixion of Jesus at his death happened for a specific reason, which is so that the scripture might be fulfilled. And I wanted to look at that because it's a good question. What scripture? <laughs> and how is it being fulfilled? I think these are valid questions. Not that we don't trust God or that we don't trust his word, but that we look to it to answer these things. There's a reason to believe. And the fact is that at the death of Jesus, John clearly affixes two passages of Scripture to what happened there. Um, the first being that when Jesus died, he did not have any broken bones. And the second thing was that they pierced him. They pierced his side in this case, but he was confirmed to be dead by the piercing. And both of these things John records and points to saying they refer to specific passages of Scripture in the Old Testament. So we ought to look at that and understand it. Um, the record is in the 19th chapter of John, 30, 30th through the 37th verses, and I will ask you to look at that with me because it contains the information that we need to understand. The 30th verse records that when Jesus had received sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So this is the time at which Jesus dies on the cross. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, because that Sabbath was going to be a high day, this was Friday, and the next day being Saturday was going to be a high Sabbath, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So that's John 19.31, and I'll, I'll pause for a moment to comment on that, that this is how... Um, the Romans ensured a quick death on the cross. Typically, death on the cross took two or three days. Um, so, the ruling class in Judea realized that that would be the case, and they didn't want the bodies to be up on a high holy day. They wanted them to be gone by that time, so they asked Rome for the speedy death, and they got it. Rome did this by breaking their legs, which is thought to have killed them in one of a couple of ways, uh, possibly by the blood loss and or cardiac arrest that comes from the trauma, uh, or possibly because they could no longer lift themselves up to breathe. Um, so they would go much faster this way. Uh, still not a great way to die because the point was suffering and Rome was not going to let you off the hook. So this is what happened. They wanted it to be done quickly. They wanted it to happen, and, and uh, this is how the Romans were doing it at that time. So the 32nd verse of John 19 continues. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. There were three people being executed that day. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Right, no need to do that because this one's already dead. But one of the soldiers did pierce his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Piercing the side with a spear is the way of confirmation. They're um, piercing, they're um, going up the rib cage to the heart. So if by any chance he was alive, he wasn't going to be alive for very long. Um, but they also knew in, the, in that day that 
uh, a wound from a live person is going to bleed and it will be red. Uh, but the wound to a corpse was going to release separated liquid, some of it red, some of it clear. So that's also a verification of death. And this is what happened. One of the soldiers pierced his side, and at once there came out blood and water. Water means clear liquid. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows he's telling the truth that you also may believe. Which is to say, John was there, and he saw this happen. And the separation of the blood and water, the, the red and the clear liquids, um, is the clear indication that he passed away. Yeah, that was a corpse that they pierced, not a live person. These things took place, verse 36 of John 19 continues, These things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not one of his bones will be broken. And also, in the 37th verse, another scripture says, They'll look on him whom they have pierced. All right, so that's John's account. So he said, These two things, not one of his bones will be broken, that's a quote, and they'll look on him whom they have pierced. That is also a quote. And these are two things he said, that are scriptures that were fulfilled by what happened when Jesus died in this way. So our John, the Apostle John, explicitly tells us that this was part of the prophecy about Jesus. This is part of the prophecy of the Old Testament, that this would, there's something to be fulfilled, right? There's another shoe to drop. And these are the two. Now, John is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He is correct about this. Sometimes people don't like us, you know, to use the Old Testament and to look at its symbolism um, for fear that we're going to get it wrong and uh, attribute something incorrectly. But there's no concern about that here. And I would argue against the other one as well, that fear is not a good counselor. But... Um, there's no problem with that here. Here we have an inspired apostle writing that these things happened, literally, and that their happening fulfilled what had been written before, and these are the passages. These passages foretell or correspond to his death and his manner of death, the things that happened at that time. But the question for you and for me that we need to look at is how are they fulfilled? Are these literal references in the sense that they're saying, you know, the Son of God will come in the flesh and the people will kill him, but in his death there will not be any bones broken? Does it literally say it like that? That's a literal kind of foretelling that this, this takes place? And no, that's not how it works. Or they will look on him whom they have pierced, saying that, oh, the Son of God comes, he takes on the flesh, but, you know, he will suffer a wound, you know, from a spear or from a sword. No, no, it does not say that. There's not a literal fulfillment. These are spiritual in interpretation, spiritual in application. And that's the thing we're going to have to be comfortable with because John said it was so. <laughs> we can't say, Oh, it doesn't apply, or you can't read it that way. No, actually, you must read it this way, because the apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, told us to do so, that this is what it means. So what are the references? Well, the, the first one about not one of the bones will be broken is Exodus chapter 12 and verse 46, which literally does say not one of his bones will be broken. That's true. Not one of the bones will be broken. Exodus 12 and verse 46. The other one, they'll look on the one whom they've pierced, is a quotation from Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. So Exodus, of course, the book of Moses, from the time that the children of Israel are leaving Egypt, and Zechariah, a prophecy. Much later, at the time that the people were uh, captive in Babylon, or perhaps partially captive and partially starting to reestablish Judah. 
the second temple period or whatever that might be called. But these are the references in Exodus 12, verse 46, that the chapter is the institution of the Passover. Not one of his bones will be broken literally refers to you don't break any of the bones of the lamb, the Passover lamb that is being eaten at Passover in this Passover supper, this Passover meal. In a literal sense, they have been instructed to offer this lamb, and they have very clear instructions about how it should be prepared and how it should be consumed, exactly when and exactly with what it will be served and how it will be cooked. All that is laid out, and among the uh, among the uh, requirements is this, not one of the bones will be broken. We don't break the bones of that lamb in the Passover. We'll talk about Zechariah next time. Today we have enough to talk about with the Passover. <laughs> we'll observe the Passover on Zechariah today. <laughs> we'll pass that over for now. All right, so now we have to wonder about this. I, I hope that you wonder about it, or maybe you don't, but I hope that there's some curiosity there. How can John say that the crucifixion of Jesus is like the Passover in Egypt? That's the question, and is an important one. We know that it is because he said so. What happened to Jesus fulfills the Passover somehow. Well, um, again, when you look at the passage in Exodus 12, in case you haven't or are not familiar with it, I note especially the 43rd through the 47th verses where it sets out very plainly, very literally, this is the statute of the Passover. And he begins to tell them all these things, which include, and in, you know, in the 46th verse, it shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house. You shall not break any of its bones. So John's definitely quoting from the Exodus, and he's definitely quoting from the Passover. This is the passage in Exodus 12. This is the passage that defines the Passover. That's what we're talking about. Well, let me start with some very clear, direct references in your New Testament that agree with John, that are taking what John has said at face value and applying it directly to Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is the first example that I've got for you, where Paul writes the church at Corinth, and he's writing them about the fact that they are allowing somebody to be a part of the church there who is actually committing a very terrible thing, that not even the Greeks will let you do this. And they are pretty much okay with anything, but not this. It's actually reported there's sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not even tolerated among the pagans. A man has his father's wife, and you're arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. But he says at the sixth verse to them, your boasting is not good, as in you're allowing this to stand. Don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven and the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we as Christians, clearly Paul taking this spiritual reading of this, Christ is our Passover lamb. Christ is sacrificed, and our lives before him, our moral choices before him, are what's under consideration in our Passover. In their Passover, they had to observe uh, that there be no yeast, which is leaven. Leavening is yeast. That there's no yeast 
in the food. There's no yeast in the drink. That's what alcohol comes from, you know. So their wine would have been grape juice, non, you know, no alcohol there because it didn't have yeast. It didn't have time to ferment or to brew. And the bread had no yeast in it. It didn't have time to rise. But Christ is the Passover lamb. He is sacrificed. We are celebrating that festival today. And you notice he said, not with the leaven of malice and evil, the old leaven, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's clear that though they were literally forbidden from having this leaven or this yeast in their bread and in their wine, that was a spiritual symbol for sin and wrongdoing. And we today are observing the Passover as his children by removing sin and wrongdoing from our lives. And our lives are a celebration of that festival, as Paul styles it here in 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, another place would be in Luke chapter 22, where Luke records the Last Supper. And Luke, together with Paul, draw a clear distinction between the Last Supper and the Lord's Supper. They're actually different things. The Last Supper is the Passover. Luke 22, verses 7 and 8, is where you read that the day of unleavened bread came, on which the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, go prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it, which they did. And down in the 14th verse, when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I won't eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. I tell you, I from now on will not drink of the fruit of the vine till the kingdom of God comes. This is the Passover. Saying that he's not going to have another meal until the kingdom of God has come, if you will. So there's something here about the finality of this is the last meal. But it's the Passover they're having, the Passover that was prepared. But if you look at Matthew's account, especially in the 26th verse, you have a clear institution of the Lord's Supper. And my point in looking at Luke 22 is to establish that what they were doing was sitting down to eat the Passover. The things that they were partaking of were unleavened bread and unleavened wine. There was no yeast in that bread. There was no alcohol in that wine. Then, the 26th chapter of Matthew, at verse 26, as they were eating, meaning they've already, this, this is the Passover meal. They're, they've already begun to eat. As they were eating, Jesus then took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I'll not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So after they're eating, he takes bread and turns it into this symbol, saying, take and eat, this is my body. This bread, what bread? The unleavened bread of the Passover. Drink this, every one of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, my blood of the covenant. What? Drink the unleavened wine of the Passover, the grape juice, fruit of the vine. And it's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, you may recall, and I think the emphasis doesn't get put there very often, but it should be. <laughs> he's rebuking Corinth. We're breaking the thought here. But he's rebuking Corinth for taking a common meal as the church, which is a sin. They should never do that. We should never do that. He said, what, don't you have houses to eat and drink in? 
This isn't about eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is not food and drink. It's love, hope, joy, the Holy Spirit. And that's why he said to them in the 23rd verse, down through the 25th, he said, I received from the Lord what I gave you. That the Lord on the night when he was betrayed took bread and given thanks and broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. That 25th verse doesn't get the em emphasis it should. He's saying, in the same way, also, he took the cup. Right. Also, after supper. Paul's point is, the Lord's Supper is the unleavened bread and the unleavened wine that is just a portion it's not a meal. They had a meal, yes, but it was after they were eating that he took aside these symbols of these elements of the Passover and turned that into the Lord's Supper. So the Passover is that death of Christ, his body that was given for us, broken for us, his blood that was shed to ratify our agreement with God. That's the covenant in his blood. The New Testament writers clearly understood this. And that's why John uh, is able to say, without a lot of explanation in his text, you know, if you're just reading John 19, there's little explanation there. But that's because everybody else concurs with this and understands that that's the meaning of the Passover. Now consider this with me. Let's do a lightning round of Exodus 12. You want to get your Exodus 12 going with me here. They had to leave in a hurry, so let's, uh, let's join them in leaving in a hurry in Exodus 12. But how is the crucifixion like the Passover? Well, we, we've seen it with uh, the Lord's Supper, we've seen it with Jesus as the lamb, you know, his body as that unleavened bread, his blood as that unleavened wine. That is our Passover that is sacrificed. We are living a life that is the festival that is to say our lives of right doing and our uh, leaving sin and leaving the world behind. That all fits the Passover. And all that is from the New Testament in very explicit terms, as we've read. Now, let's consider the Exodus. How is the crucifixion like the Passover from the perspective of the Exodus? Well, one way is that it's the beginning of salvation. In Exodus 12, at verse 2, the Lord, well, even verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month will be for you the beginning of months. It will be the first month of the year for you. So their time, their reckoning begins right here with their Passover. This is where everything becomes new for them. They are the birth of a nation, the start of their calendar. And as he reminds them in the 17th verse later, you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread for on this very day, I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. This is the day they, he took them out. So it is the beginning of deliverance, the beginning of salvation. And isn't that true of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus? Yes. Yes. That's the beginning of salvation. That's the first offering that could actually take away sins, that could actually um, um, forgive in perpetuity. He doesn't have to offer many times. He doesn't have to offer for himself. This high priest is greater. He has ascended into the heavens. Also in Exodus 12, you see the thing that's being offered in the third verse, tell all the congregation, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's household, a lamb for a household. And in the fifth verse, 
Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. It's the lamb. It's a lamb without blemish. A young lamb, one that's just starting in life, in lamb life, you know, <laughs> uh, a year. But for Jesus, he had just turned 30 when he began to teach. That's when they considered them adults. Then he began to teach, and he taught for a year, years and a half a year, about three and a half years before his death and burial and resurrection. He is the lamb, and the household is the house of God. And he was without blemish. He was sinless. In Exodus 12, 13, did it not say, The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, says the Lord God, I will pass over you. No plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Yes, the blood of the lamb is what saves it's the blood of the lamb. The lamb was sacrificed, and that blood saves the people of God. It separates them from the rest of the world that is around them. On the, at the time when God saves them, he saves them, and it's by means of the blood of the lamb shed. The third verse, you remember, he said, All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. Tell the whole congregation to do this. Right, the 47th verse as well, he said, everybody in the congregation, the entire congregation shall keep it. The whole congregation does this, which is true. When we take the Lord's Supper, we all take the Lord's Supper. When we are living lives separate from the world, putting away sin, we're all doing that. In accord with 1 Corinthians 5, above. And in Exodus 12, 25 to 27, he makes this provision that they'll come into the promised land and they're going to keep observing it even there. Long time from now. When you come to the land, the Lord gives you 25 down to 27 of Exodus 12. As he promised, you'll keep this service there too. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You tell them it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover because the Lord passed over the houses of the people in Egypt the people of Israel in Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. It's what Jesus said, even today in the kingdom of God, we're keeping the Passover, you see. It's fulfilled. This was a symbol of what was coming, but the reality is righteous living today, the, the perfect sacrifice of the real Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. We're the fulfillment of that. And you know, what John cited at the 46th verse is an instance, it's John, uh, I'm sorry, the 46th verse of Exodus 12. What John cited from the Passover is an instance of what I call a frightening precision. Frightening because when the Lord says things like this and you see them come to pass, you realize the power of God and his word. How much detail he gave us centuries before. And this was the original reference for our current lesson from John 19. You shall not break any of its bones, Exodus 12, 46. That's true. It did say that about the Passover. And his bones were not broken. And it was unusual. The other's bones were broken. But isn't it so also in Exodus 12? At the 10th verse, did you notice? You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains till morning shall be burned. Let none of it remain until morning. Well, that's funny, because when they crucified Jesus, they said, we don't want them to be there in the morning, because tomorrow is a high festival. Break their legs and take them down today before, before the festival gets here. Remember, they didn't want to let any of it remain till morning. And it, there's also in the seventh verse, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. That's to say, on the left side and the right side and above. Uh, 
Or perhaps, well, perhaps that would be on, on the threshold or floor, but I'm pretty sure what they mean by lintel is the thing above, but whatever it is, what is it? Well, it's blood on wood, and there's even three places for it. We know that they drove nails through his hands, through his feet. We know that there was blood on wood that this lamb, Jesus, suffered horribly. There's a frightening precision about this. And, you know, Psalm 22 is the same way. Many of these passages have a clarity and a precision that is shocking in retrospect. <laughs> now, in the eighth verse of Exodus 12, did you notice this one? They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night. And you know, this is actually something that Jesus said in the Gospel of John in the sixth chapter. And I do want to look at that one at length here, if you will allow me, because as we say, it's kind of shocking the correspondence. But John 6, 48, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This, however, is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. He, his body, is the bread, the Passover, that they must partake of, that we must partake of. And at the 53rd of John 6, So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. My flesh is true food. My blood is is true drink. Jesus is that Passover lamb. He is the bread. He is the wine. His body, his blood. And it's a terrible figure, but it's true. That's what happened. You know, back in Exodus 12, also shoring up this case, the Lord told them that this thing they're doing, this Passover, not just now to get out of Egypt, but for every year following this, all the way through the uh, inhabit or inhabiting the promised land, something they're going to keep doing. And he tells them in the 14th, this day, Exodus 12, 14, this day will be for you a memorial day. You will keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations, a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. It is a memorial. And it's what Jesus said at the Last Supper, actually at the Lord's Supper in, Exodus, in Luke twenty two nineteen, 19. Do this as a memorial to me, in memory. In memoriam, you know. That's what it is, the Lord's Supper. Because he is our Passover. He's the one whose blood was shed so that we could have forgiveness. He's the one whose body was broken so that we could have liberty and escape the world. Yes, when the children of Israel escaped in the Exodus, I'm sorry, well, in the Passover, Exodus 12 records for us in the 39th verse that they're leaving. It says, they baked unleavened cakes from the dough that they had brought out of Egypt because it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and couldn't wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves either. Did you notice when they left, they were in a hurry? And it was not leavened because of time. And they had prepared no provisions. They left the world and they had not packed any bags to fulfill the things of the world which your New Testament says as well. 
For example, in Romans chapter 13, in verses 13 and 14, where he said, Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And you may recall from earlier, as we mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, that Paul said, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven. We make no provision for the old things. We, don't, we didn't bring anything out of Egypt. When you obey the gospel, you leave the world behind and you don't bring it with you. You go into the water of baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness, and you come back out, but your sins don't. You've been washed from the world. The children of Israel crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but Egypt did not come across the Red Sea. They washed up later on the shore. Yes, in John... We talk about the things that make for salvation. Have you today escaped from the world? Have you escaped from the consequences of your sins and your wrongdoing? By naming Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, by repenting of sins, by being buried with him in baptism for forgiveness of sins. In John 1, we have the record of the testimony of the last prophet, John, John the Baptist, in the 29th through the 34th verses, but he says plainly there, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, this John saw Jesus and exclaimed to his disciples, those who were there listening to John, he told them, that guy, that is the one. There is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And he talks about the things that happened, that the Spirit told him how he would know, that he would see the Holy Spirit descend on him as a dove, which is exactly what happened. And he said in the 34th verse, I have seen, I have borne witness, this is the Son of God. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Repent. Give your life to him. Live right from here on as we read. Knowing that he is able to save for eternity. He is able to deliver us from everything and from every evil. That you can be saved from everything that is in the past. And that you can be resurrected from the water of baptism, from the grave of the old person and the old ways of sin in the old world a new creature created in Christ Jesus for good works. And this perpetual Passover that is Christian living, where you make the right choices from now on, you serve God from now on, you live not for yourself, but for him who's, who died for you. We have water prepared that you may be baptized, if that is your need. Today, are you a Christian but not living right? Repent, make things right with God. Remember what it is that we are doing here who it is that we are serving, and how quickly eternity is, is coming. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, please let your need be known in the Spirit by coming to the front while we stand, while we sing the song selected.